I'm sitting here talking to y'all, and suddenly I get this message that says my my internet connection has been interrupted, or it was weak, or something like that. Now I don't understand why because I looked at my modem and I still had had internet, so I'm assuming that this was a an issue on the the HCC side. How many Why aren't you starting? How many tiers does Texas have in its judicial system? I think it was like five levels or something. Wait, no, judicial system? The judicial system. Latoya, you're right. I'm waiting to see if Bruce comes up with it. Is it three? It's three. What are they? What are the three levels, lowest to highest? What are the three levels of our judicial system, lowest to highest? Trial is the lowest. What's next? Court of Appeals are the appellate courts, the circuit courts. And the highest? Supreme. Supreme, yeah. Okay, partially right. Supreme is partially right. Please remember, we have a bifurcated system. Oh, municipal courts. No, no, for the highest, we have a bifurcated system. We have two courts. We have the, the Texas Supreme Court, and we have the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. So we do have those three levels. The bottom levels are trial courts. Middle level is our appellate courts, our circuit courts, our court of appeals. The highest level is either going to be the Texas Supreme Court or the Court of Criminal Appeals. And I'll explain which one it is today. You said municipal courts. Remember, and the reason that Bruce said five is, I showed you this chart the other or yesterday. I'm used to being in on a twice a week system. And there were five levels here. So this is where Bruce got five. But I said these bottom three, the district court, the county level courts, justice we courts, and the municipal courts or the trial courts. We can't see anything. Why not? It tells me I'm sharing this dang thing. I can you? see it. I can see the PowerPoint. I can't see anything. That's crazy. I'm seeing the court system PowerPoint and the five levels right now. Everybody else, are y'all seeing it or no? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. looking at the chat and they said that they're seeing it. Yeah, Latoya, it's... Uh, they're saying go ahead and, and rejoin the meeting and see if that boots you into it. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Like I thought I did it right this time. Re and remember, our trial courts, what kind of jurisdiction do they have? If we're talking about their job, what kind of jurisdiction do they have? Is it local? No, when it comes to their jobs, what they're supposed to do, I'm not talking about area of authority jurisdiction that way. I'm talking about their jobs. What is the job of the trial courts? What kind of jurisdiction they have? do they have? No, the trial courts. That your your the trial courts. They have original jurisdiction. Y'all remember those two types of jurisdiction? We came to jobs. We talked about original and appellate.
Santiago, what's original jurisdiction? Right, they're going to hear the case for the first time. They're going to determine the facts of the case. All trial courts have original jurisdiction. The Court of Appeals has appellate jurisdiction. And that's the power to review the decisions of the lower court. And if we're talking that highest level, Court of Criminal Appeals, they have appellate. Supreme Court has appellate jurisdiction with just a little bit of original jurisdiction thrown in. Oh, God, I'm glad you're back in, LaToya. I was just talking to, going over the, the original and appellate jurisdiction that we went over yesterday. Okay, thank you. So let's go back. I, we've gone over municipal courts. Remember, these are city courts. They, they handle the, the least important, or they handle the most minor Class C violations. They handle city ordinances. Started going over the JP, Justice of the Peace Court. And this, I think, is where we got messed up yesterday. This is where I got knocked off. Remember I said their duties, they perform marriages, coroner duties. If the county does not have a coroner, the justice of the peace can act as a coroner. They will pronounce cause of death. Ex officio notary. Ex officio is a term that you will hear again next week it ex officio means because of this i am that because of this i am that hey juan's not with us today he's usually with us on a daily basis so to become a notary you fill out your application you send that and your payment to the state the state gets your money and they say congratulations you're a notary it's a little bit more complicated, but honestly, not much. Once they get your money, they're fairly happy. Ex officio, because of this, I am that. Once you become an elected JP, a justice of the peace, you don't even have to mess with that small part of paperwork, that small part of the bureaucracy. As soon as you become a JP, you are automatically a notary. Because you are a JP, you are a notary. Because I am this... I am also that. Then small claims court. Remember it went up to $10,000. Certain circumstances have to be met to be allowed into Justice of the Peace Court, JP Court, as a small claims court. Created by the Texas Constitution. I told you that was going to happen. Original jurisdiction over Class C misdemeanor cases and small claims. They had, there were 820 JP courts in the state of Texas as of 2012. Case load. In fiscal year 2012, more than 2.58 million new cases were tried in JP courts. Other duties. They are real judges. They can issue search warrants. They can issue arrest warrants. I said they sign, They serve as coroners in counties with no provisions for a medical examiner. Now, this one is kind of neat. JP, they sign eviction notices. You become a landlord and your, your tenant stops paying their rent. Can you go over there and change the locks and lock them out? No, you have to file for an eviction paper, or like so you can post it. What are they gonna? Right there, there's actually paperwork involved. You have to go through the JP down to the JP court and file to get an eviction notice signed. The JP signs the notice, and it has to be delivered by a constable. So you just can't go over there and change the change the logs, you know, keep them out of the house. You actually have to go through a JP. They have to sign an eviction notice. 
The justice of the peace is the only one in Texas who has the authority to sign this eviction notice. Nobody else can. County courts at law. We are now under this big, and I'm sure you can't see it, but we're we're under this the second level of we're working up. This is county uh, county courts at law. Please, please, please highlight or or make some type of note. Put a star, an asterisk, something like that by county courts at law because we are going to have a county court and I want you to understand that these are different. The county court at law is different from the county courts. So county court at law. And Deciana, are you on with us today? No, there she's not here. I think she's the one that asked yesterday about the different courts that see that that have the different jurisdictions over the different levels of crime. Remember, the municipal, the JP court, only had jurisdiction over class C misdemeanors. County courts at law, created by the Texas legislature, they have original jurisdiction over class A and class B misdemeanors. So I said we have two types of laws. We have civil law and we have criminal law. And we divide our criminal law into felonies. These are the most serious crimes. And into misdemeanors. And that's what this next lecture that I've posted is about. Felonies, misdemeanors. Felonies, we subdivide felonies into degrees. We have first degree uh, we have capital felony or capital murder, first degree felony, second degree felony, third degree felony, state jail felony. Then we have our misdemeanors. We subdivide these misdemeanors into subcategories and using letters. Class A misdemeanor, class B misdemeanor, class C misdemeanor. Class C is the, the lowest misdemeanor. What do, you, what do you think Class B is? In the middle. <clears throat> Excuse me, that water went down on. It's a little bit worse, but not horrible in the same. <clears throat> same with Class A. So they're going to talk about our Class A and Class B misdemeanors. This is where we're going to start to see incarceration as, as a possible... Dang, dang, come on. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm dying here. This is only water, guys. This is where we're going to see fine as a punishment. This is where we're going to start to see incarceration as a, as a possible punishment. So we're talking reckless driving. It could be, I think public intoxication is a B. It could be driving while intoxicated, certain levels of assault, certain, certain levels of theft. So this is where we have these differences. Now, I'm going to tell you this, but it is rarely used. So I want you to know that it exists. But it, it's very, very odd to see. The county courts at law, these courts that do Class A and Class B, they do have some appellate jurisdiction. If you lose your case at the, at the local level, at the municipal court, at the JP court, you have the right to appeal to the county court at law. And I say this is different. 
Remember, when we're talking about appellate courts, they are, they are going to review the decision of a lower court. Well, what we see in these county courts at law, what we're going to see in our district courts, maybe you've seen it in person, maybe you've seen it on TV. If you have seen it in person because you were accused of a crime, please don't tell us. That's too much information. But you go into court and you have your judge sitting up there on the bench. And there's that person sitting down there at the bottom on the, on the floor. Their, their little station is on the floor. And they're typing away on this really strange looking machine. Anybody know who that is or what that position is called? Um, I don't, I don't know what the position is called, but the purpose is to like record the whole conversation that goes on between the defendant, the judge, and the, and the, and the lawyers. Right. That position is called techni uh, technically it is called the stenographer. That is the official title of the, of the position we usually refer to it as a court reporter. Guys, they can make some good money if you go to court reporting school and get certified. You can make really good money doing this. But anyway, like Bruce said, their job is to sit there and take note of everything that's said. So what happens is they have their own little shorthand. They type it up on the, their machine. And when court's over, they go back to their office and they, they translate this. They put this in English that you and I and everybody else can understand. This is what's called the court record. They are creating the court record. The court record is what the appellate courts look at for mistakes. This is what they're going to review. Now, this is where this gets tricky. The lowest courts, the municipal courts and the, the JP courts, they do not have a court reporter. They do not have a stenographer in their court. So if you appeal their their court decision and it goes up to the county court at law what do they review how do they know if proper procedure was was followed well, Layla what do you think how do they know if, if, if proper procedure is followed? There's one. They don't. They don't. How come? Because there's no one to record it, so there would be no, no traces of, of them knowing if they did their job properly or not. That's, that's exactly the correct answer. They don't know because there is no, there is no court record. So instead, what happens is the county court will offer what's called, called a trial de, D-E, novo, N-O-V-O, trial de novo. And all this means is that they're going to give you a brand new trial. Trial de novo is a brand new trial. Now, I am starting to see some areas, I think Katie has one, they've actually created a court to handle these appeals from the lower level courts, from those local courts. But for the most part, well, let, let me put it this way. I told you I was in, in, I worked for the probation department. The last, my last year I spent downtown at the courthouse working in the courts. On a good day, these county courts, they would have 75 to 95 cases scheduled for, per day. On an average day, it'd be about 125 to 140. Average day. Do you think that they have time to hear your, your cruddy little moving citation case? It would be inefficient if they did. It'd be inefficient. So most of the time, they're just going to to dismiss the case. But that does exist. So no trial de novo.
As of 2012, there's 236 county courts at law. Caseload, more than 769,000 cases were filed in the fiscal year 2012. The judge is elected to a four-year term. So we do vote for these judges. Any questions about county court at law? Okay, your silence is a consent to go on. District courts. That third level that makes up the trial courts on that chart I gave you. District courts created by the Texas legislature. Original jurisdiction over all felony criminal cases. They're going to have jurisdiction over most family law, this divorce cases, adoption, that kind of thing. Cases involving title of land, election contest cases, civil matters in which the amount of damages involved is $200 or more, and it cannot be heard in JP court. Because remember, JP went up to $10,000, but I said there were certain criteria that had to be met. If that criteria can't be met, it can't be heard in JP court, it is going to come to district court. And then any matters in which jurisdiction, in which the area of authority is not placed in another trial court. This is going to be kind of our catch-all court. Trying to figure out when I want to say this. Okay. In densely populated counties, district courts may specialize in civil, civil matters, civil law. They may specialize in criminal law, juvenile law, family law matters, this kind of thing. Is Harris County a densely populated county? Yes, we are. So when we go elect our judges, we are actually voting for district court judges in civil courts. We are actually voting for district court judges in criminal courts, in juvenile courts, or family in family court. This is the only area that they handle. This is the only area of law that they handle cases in. So our criminal judges, all they have to know is criminal law. When we get to some of these more sparsely populated, some of these less popu populous counties. Uh, what What is Brian in? Brazos County. There we go. When I was working up there, one of the adjuncts, he, he would teach at night just for fun, just for kicks. He was actually a district judge. But because the, the county population is so small, they didn't specialize. He didn't get to specialize. He had to have knowledge in all of these areas. I remember one night I walked, he walked in, and I was getting ready to walk out. And his name was J.D. I said, hey, J.D., how's it going? How was court today? He said, well, it was one of those days that it varied. I had a divorce court. I had a divorce case in the morning. And I had a murder case in the afternoon. Okay. Keeps you on your toes. But those are district courts. Those are this highest, highest court in the trial level. Trial tier. 456 courts as of 2012. Considered to be the chief trial court of the state. It handles more cases that should be than, not and. It handles more cases than the U.S. district courts. 
And in that lecture I provided, I explain why it handles more cases. Twenty twelve Texas District Courts took on more than eight hundred thousand new cases. And I want y'all to understand, I'm throwing these numbers out here, 800,000. Does that mean we had 800,000 individuals who were accused of breaking the law? No. No, how come? Why not? There's That's divorce. the correct answer. There's like divorce and then like, uh, there's more, there's more, but I, I don't remember the terminology. Like, um... I guess like disputes over over property or something sometimes. Well, remember, we can have all these types of disputes. We're not just talking about criminal cases here. But even if we're talking about criminal cases, say say there are 300,000 new cases. Does that mean that we had 300,000 individuals accused of breaking a law? No, how come, Daniel? You're right. That's the right answer. How come it's not, does, if we have 300,000 new cases, how come it's not individuals? Um, Because, like, can't you take, like, the government or something like that? Or is, like, it depends on the case. Well, can you can you get charged with more than one charge? Uh, Yes. Yeah, you can. Yeah, what? Well, Tamawa says one person might break multiple laws, so you might get multiple charges. Or else, like what we're seeing now that's making a lot of people mad, and we had one of these a couple of, well, six or eight weeks ago, but it's, it's very, it's occurring more often. People, they're arrested for a charge, and they're given, pro, uh, they're given a bond hearing. I talk about bond in that other one. And they're let out while they're waiting their their court hearing. And what do they do while they're out on bond? Get another charge. They, they get another charge. They, they break another law and they get charged again. Why is this actually becoming an issue right now? Why are people so mad about this? Because, uh, well, from what I see, people are out on bond for serious charges, serious felony accusations, and... They're continuing to violate their bond. So it's, um, I don't know, I guess I feel like people are more mad about it due to a safety issue and the fact that they're so lenient to give bonds on serious charges. That is it exactly. If you look at it, if you're watching the news this year alone, how many news stories have we seen that somebody was out on bond and they killed, or at least they're, they're, they allegedly killed somebody else. They committed murder while they're out on bond. We had a couple of them that were out on bond for murder that murdered somebody else, allegedly. And, and I feel like that's the... I just feel like that's on the court. Like, the, the court is so, like, kind of dumb for doing that. Like, if they, if they have a charge of murder, why would you even let them out? Like, no, you're supposed to, like, lock them in a jail for until they prove their innocence at that point. But that's the thing. You're, you're, you're innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, but like, so, I mean, be just because you're accused of murder doesn't mean you've necessarily, you know what I mean? I feel like, like. Just because like, you're accused doesn't mean you're guilty. You know what I mean? I feel like, yeah, we, we, some people don't like I the fact like that they're given bond, but. Like, like, instead of a cell, maybe like a little comfort, like a little, little space. I don't know. I believe that nobody where, where should until, be left until in jail, the trial especially if they're and not they have to stay there. I feel like everyone should be at least granted the opportunity, if possible, you know, like if you violated multiple bonds, then I could see in them provoking your bond or if you were already out on probation. But if you've been accused of something, I feel like there's not a, a re like, you know, if we're going to talk about Constitution and things like that. And you can't just deny someone bond because they were accused of murder. You know what I mean? There's people accused of all kinds of accusations that aren't true. Right. And Danielle says it should be a case by case issue. But part of it is, is there is a constitutional right to, to bail or to bond. So 
we, we have to walk this type tight rope. And then what happened to Harris County a couple of years ago is that, well, if you can't make bond, you sit in jail. So actually, are you, you're, as said, you're punishing the poor and, and not the rich. They're not being treated equally because the rich can make bond where the poor can't. It's a very, very tricky situation that we're trying to, to figure out. But yeah, I mean, remember, just because you're charged doesn't mean you're guilty. You, it's a, you allegedly did this. But, but I mean, even if they're charged for something, like, they, they should at least put some thought into it. Like, put them, like, not in a cell, maybe, but, like, maybe um, a room or something. So if you were charged with rape, right, you, yeah. and you know that, you know that this, this, this is just fabricated accusations and they tell you that your court date isn't due to back up due, due to um large caseloads you have to sit in jail six months to a year I to put them in jail i said like to put them in a room or something where it's so you, why would, what type of why would i be sitting in a room you know what i mean why would you want to sit in a room for six months to a year when you know you're innocent of something and just cut off your daily not your daily, but like say you have a family or whatever the case may be, and these are but total false. That are guilty and they let them out on bond so they just kill more people. But how do you know they're guilty? So I believe that priors should be taken into consideration. Yeah, priors. Bond, but at the same time, I do agree with what you're saying on the part of there's no reason, especially you're not guilty until you're proven guilty. You're in, you're, you're innocent. So there's no reason for you to be locked away. Period. If evidence haven't even been examined. Now, Bruce, no I understand what you're saying. And for safety's purposes. For a long point of time or term of time, if there's no evidence or nobody's ruling on the case, that I just I disagree with that. I think what they're saying, Bruce, is, you know, whether you lock him in a cell or whether you lock him in a hotel room, <laughs> You know, even if it's a five star room, are they are you are they still incarcerated? Do they have the ability to leave when they want? I think or that's their they, argument. Or another here. solution could be to like monitor them. Like they could be free, but they could have like a monitoring system. Yeah, they do that. They put ankle monitors, they do house arrest. It just depends on the severity of the the charges and priors. They look at everything. They look at if they have monitor devices, how do they how do they sometimes end up killing people? Exactly. Well, at the same time, you have people who just make sure you don't exceed the state. state. That's all it does. The ankle monitors. They don't. They make sure you don't reach a certain limit. Yeah, it's yeah, an electronic and, monitoring system, and that you're not monitored twenty four hours a day. They don't. You know, they don't watch what you're doing every minute of every day. So you can you can leave your area and go do whatever and come back, and eventually, whenever they run that report daily or however often, they will. You've already committed. You. A, yeah. You left your area. That's the problem. It doesn't hold you there. Well, if someone's on bond, they should monitor them 24-7 if that's the case. I guess it just depends on the severity because speaking, I mean. I just feel like it's weird if, like, um, he murdered, the case is murder, and you're just like, oh, yeah, you can just roam free. Like, you should monitor him 24-7. But the thing is, he's still innocent until proven guilty. So therefore, like it's almost impossible to mind. Incarcerated, so you can spend time with your family, you in your house. You're what, what I was saying was, it's just it's almost nearly impossible to fully monitor someone twenty four seven, especially with so many people accused of right. first degree felonies. That's like impossible to do. What an ankle monitor? They know who you are, and it's like you can't be away from your house for uh so long like x amount of times like you have a curfew and everything like that so i just feel like if someone is like accused of murder or rape or stuff like that it should be like yeah you can like don't leave your house as often or like you should be able to leave your house like just for a certain amount of time like five minutes ten minutes something like that because like it just they allow them to still work. But like, isn't that still being prosecuted? That's how exactly you exactly. You can't do it. that's still being prosecuted. I mean, I could understand. No, because you're not but... incarcerated. It's the difference. But you're still being. You're you still being. Incarcerated if you're the case is still. 
because the face of the monitor is arrest. arrest. Dumb, right? I mean, and then and then y'all talking about house arrest and then saying they should leave five, 10 minutes. And then the case ends up being dropped. Or the reason why they allow people on ankle monitors to still go to work, still provide, still do, you know, normal activity is because they are still innocent until proven guilty. I mean, if nobody been through it, they're not going to understand. So it's, it's going to be a I've been through it. I have two brothers that's locked up and I have a friend right now who's fighting a murder case. So I, I've worked for you, criminal. I've, I work at a criminal law firm. So I, I know. So I wasn't talking about you personally because I've been through the same thing. I'm just saying in general. At a conversation. Sheriff's office. Oh, I understand. Oh, being that I used to work at a sheriff's office, um, during COVID time, they did let some people out who were convicted, and just because you know, they felt like, oh, it, it was a safety hazard. They let them out to be on house arrest for murder charges and everything. COVID was special. We we saw a lot of things change in COVID. I'm going to go ahead and move on now. So, because I want to get done because I, I want us to end relatively early. Yes, please. Everybody's making good points, you know, but remember, these are, a, you are guilty or you're innocent until proven guilty. These are alleged crimes. And we do have that pesky Eighth, eighth Amendment thing, you know, that the right against cruel and unusual punishment. So we're we're trying the best we can. And we're we're always looking at better options. And the reason I actually have legislators always looking for better options. I feel like that they're I feel like Texas as a state is very content with making money off of private, what is it, private penitentiaries. And I don't feel like there's a lot of, a lot of new legislature coming through personally. I mean, that's my personal opinion. I'm sorry to cut you off, Professor, but. No, no, no. And that's okay. That That's fine. I mean, you, you have a point. And, but what I was saying is the reason we have these discussions is, Remember, I told y'all, I wanted y'all to think, you know, if there's a problem that we need to fix, you're saying we're not having much legislation come through because apparently they're fairly happy with the way things are. Well, you come up with ideas and you go tell your elected officials, or better yet, you don't tell your elected officials, what do you do? If you don't tell your elected official, what do you do? <laughs> become an elected official. <laughs> That's it, exactly. You become an elected official. That is what you do. You become one and you take care of business. Because what did I say the other day about these people that have been in there for so, been in office for so long and they're happy with the way things are? They're not willing to see anything new. Become an elected official. Change things. Make things better. Guys, these people that we have in office are eventually, and this sounds horrible, but it's true, they are eventually going to die. And we are going to need them replaced. Who's going to replace them? Guys, who's going to replace them? with real life accounts of what's going on, especially in the penitentiary system, especially with people having members or family members or even personal experiences should be the ones that take the place or should be the ones communicating with these elective officials because a lot of the time they're not taking into account the impact that these little things that are, are making the money have on the citizens of their city or of their state. So. I mean, right, but my, my question, no, I agree with everything you're saying, but my question is, once something happens to these elected officials that are making these decisions, because eventually... Are they replaced? By who? By other elected officials, I guess. Once these die, who's going to become these new elected officials? Not quite sure. The newer yeah. generation? Y'all are. Y'all are. Pretty soon, no, not... You know, fairly soon, y'all are going to be responsible for this. So if you already know there's issues and you already have ideas on how to fix it, are we that much closer to solving the issue? 
guys, think about this, pros and cons. How can we do better? Let your, let your elected official know how we can do better. If they don't listen, become an elected official. Do it yourself. You can. That's the beautiful thing about here. You can run for office. You can make the change. Juveniles. What's a juvenile? Oh, uh, minor has been doing, uh, you know, like. It's a kid. It's a minor. Not links, pretty much. Not an adult. In Texas, it's 17, actually. In, in criminal law. Why are most juvenile cases tried in district court? Bruce made a comment the other day. I was talking about running for office, and I asked us, I asked the class, how many of us have some deep, dark secret that we don't want exposed? And everybody but Bruce said, me. Bruce said, I don't. I'm not encouraging you to do something stupid, Bruce. Please don't take it that way. The idea we try cases in juvenile court is what happens if you get the, if you're tagged as a felon? It stays on your record. So whenever people, or you look for a job, it shows on your record. Yeah, you're a felon for the rest of your life. And bad things happen. You're going to have trouble getting housing, finding jobs, this kind of stuff. Well, the idea is that kids, these juveniles under 17, that they're young and dumb. So if we try a juvenile case in district court, we're actually going to try it in civil court. We're not going to try it in criminal court. We're going to try it in civil court. That way, if they are adjudicated guilty, if they are found guilty of the charge, they don't have a, a felony record. They don't, they're not tagged as a felon. This way we're not ruining their future. And I talk about that again in the next lecture. Okay, that's it for trial courts, those bottom three. The local courts, JP Municipal, the middle court, court uh, excuse, the middle court there is the county court at law, and then the district court. These are our trial courts. We're moving to Court of Appeals. These have areas of jurisdiction, uh, physical areas. You can see through here there is a mistake on, on this map. The court in Amarillo should be Court 7 instead of Court 1. But these Court of Appeals are giving, giving certain physical areas of, of authority. So if you're trying to case, if you're appealing a case from Laredo or from Brownsville, Raymondville, wherever, it's going to go to Corpus. Anywhere out here, West Texas, uh, Sanderson, what else is out there? That is that. What's the county out there? Is that Tarrant the County, county out there? No. Uh, Lang Tree. These areas are going to go to El Paso. But that's all. Houston. We have four. How are we have two? Excuse me. How come Houston has two courts? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, I only see one on the map, or do I have it wrong? You only see what? I only see, like, one on Houston. 14, right here next to it. Okay. Are y'all seeing my map in Texas, guys? I think it's not, like, by 11 or, like, 14. I thought they like, well, they have 11 courts there. So I had it wrong. That's on me. Sorry about that. Houston has two courts. They have one and they have 14. Why do we have two courts?
Who's the largest city in the state? What's the largest area in the state? Cherish, why do you think we, we have two courts? Because of our population. Yeah, so simply population. We have more people, we have more courts. So let's talk about the Court of Appeals for a few minutes. We have 14 Court of Appeals spread out throughout Texas, each with their own geographical area of jurisdiction. So what's decided in one area, what's decided in court seven, only applies to the lower courts in court seven. If something's decided in court 14, it only applies to the area of that court 14 covers, the Houston area. The court of appeal, the court of appeals, they hear appeals, they have jurisdiction, over both civil and criminal cases. So they have jurisdiction over both civil and criminal law. Our judges are elected to six-year terms. Um, let's talk about the difference between the Court of Appeals and and the the trial courts and just in the process itself. How many judges are in charge? How many judges exist do we have in a trial court? Okay. How many courts are, how many judges are in charge of that one court? When you watch a TV show. Two? For a trial court, you have never seen two judges in a trial court. And I How see many judge duties are there? One. One. One, yeah. That was my answer. I, you said two, I thought. No, I said one early before that. Oh, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. One. Think about it. You know, when you go in, you see these, these trial courts. There's only one judge that's in, in charge of everything. And actually, their main job is to rule on on questions, on, on legal questions. You know, I want to make an objection to this. Okay, I'm going to, I, I object to this. I'm going to sustain. Yes, you're right, it, it can't happen. I'm going to overrule your objection. I'm going to allow it. Or that kind of thing. They, they're kind of the mediator. They don't, they don't play favorites. They don't get involved. The Court of Appeals, well, let's go back to, no, I'm not, actually, I'm not done yet with the trial court. How long does a case last, or how long can a, a case last in a trial court? It can be two hours, it can be two weeks, it can be two months. It all depends on the type of case, how many witnesses, all this stuff. The case can, can go on. In the Court of Appeals, this operates differently. First off, it's timed. Each appellate case, it lasts about an hour and 15 minutes. You go in front of a three, three judge panel. You start to make your case. At the trial level, the judge doesn't really talk to you. They just say, yes, I'm going to... So sustain your objection, or I'm going to overrule your objection. The Court of Appeals, these judges, they can actually talk to the attorney. They interact with them. 
They can ask them questions. They can ask for clarification. So at the Court of Appeals, you go in, you're in front of three judges, the plaintiff's attorney, they start off, they're given like 30 minutes, I think, 40 minutes. Argue. Tell me why the lower court was wrong. They make their argument. The, the defense attorney comes up and they say, no, this is why the plaintiff's attorney was wrong. This is why the lower court was right. And they're given like 30 minutes. After that, the plaintiff gets to go again. This is called a rebuttal. They're given like 10 minutes to say, no, 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 I'm right. The defense attorney's wrong. This is why. Once after that, the defense attorney, once again, it's their turn. They're given like five minutes to say, no, forget them. They're wrong. I don't, they're, they're brand new out of law school. They don't know what they're talking about. Believe me. Once this is over, I mean, that's it for the trial. The actual trial then is over. Then the three judges will meet at a later date and they will discuss the trial. They will discuss the legal merits, who made the case, legally who was correct. Then they will write their opinion. And their opinion is telling us who's right and who's wrong, who won and who lost, and the legal reasoning behind that. These opinions are important because it sets precedent. It tells, if court 10 does it, it tells all the lower courts, all the trial courts in court 10, this, these are the steps, these are the rules you're supposed to follow. Is there some legal opinion coming out? What's today? Probably in the next week and a half at the, at the federal level. That's got people all a Twitter. Is the U.S. Supreme Court going to release opinion by the end of June that people are already mad about, even though it hasn't been released? Samuel, is there, is there an opinion coming out that people are mad about, even though it hasn't been released? Zane, is there an opinion coming out that people are mad about, even though it hasn't been released? Bruce, say something so I know y'all can hear me. I can hear you, Professor. Okay. Thank you. Is it the trial about what happened like January sixth? Is that what no, that that's in that's Congress is holding that. That's oh. this is an actual case from the Supreme Court. They're set to issue an opinion. All their big opinions are issued at the end of June as they're as they're finishing up their term. What's the big issue that's going to be addressed? What a, they're, they're issuing an opinion on a case. It's going to set precedent. It's going to tell us what steps we have to follow. Really? Nobody can tell me this? What have people been mad about for about the last month? What was your question? I'm sorry, I just came back. The Supreme Court is getting ready to issue an opinion in the next couple of weeks about a major, a major issue. Brittany wrote down abortions. Yeah, we're getting Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade, right? Their decision is going to affect. They have authority over the entire United States. Their their decision is going to tell us if Roe versus Wade, if abortions are going to remain legal or not. These, these court decisions are very important. They set precedent. They tell the lower courts how, how to handle, how to handle future cases. Court of Appeals. Judges are elected to six-year terms. They are staggered. We elect, no, excuse me. 
they, while they are staggered, we elect one every two years for the Court of Appeals. Candidates must be at least 35 years of age, minimum of 10 years experience as a lawyer or a judge is required. Our highest courts. Remember, we have a bifurcated court system thanks to an amendment we passed in 1891. For reasons unknown to me, I'm just going to say we're Texas. We're special. We looked around and we looked at Oklahoma, and Oklahoma had a bifurcated court system. And we said, we want to be like Oklahoma. Why would we want to be like Oklahoma? Taylor, why would we want to be like Oklahoma? This is a serious question. Why? Zane, why would we want to be like Oklahoma? I have no idea, but for some reason in 1891 we wanted to be. So we passed this constitutional amendment. We copied Oklahoma. And we have this bifurcated court system. Our highest courts. I'm going to start off with the Court of Criminal Appeals. Yeah, what does bifurcated mean? Bifurcated. Again. What does by mean? Double. Means two. So we're going to have two courts. Give me a second. See if you can figure out the difference. The Court of Criminal Appeals. Nine judges on the Court of Criminal Appeals. They are elected. It is like the appellate court, except your case is heard in front of all nine judges at once. It is timed. They can interact with you. Okay? But there's nine judges on the Court of Criminal Appeals. It is the highest state appellate court in criminal matters. This is the highest court in criminal law. You can't go anywhere else. Our judges are elected for six-year overlapping staggered terms. So we're electing three judges to the Court of Criminal Appeals every two years. You must be at least 35 years old. Must be a lawyer or, that's supposed to be our judge from a lower court with 10 years of experience. The Court of Criminal Appeals has exclusive jurisdiction over automatic appeals and death penalty cases. Okay, when I ask you, when you were at the trial level and you lost a case and you were appealed, did the Court of Appeals have to hear your appeal or did they have a choice? Choice. They had a choice. Well, the same thing happens for our highest courts, for the Texas Supreme Court, the Court of Criminal Appeals. They have a choice if they want to review the decisions by the appellate court. And Bruce had said yesterday, you know, don't they, like the U.S. Supreme Court, they only hear this many. It's like, it's a very, very small percent. They hear very few cases. They have the choice. Is there a constitutional question? There is one exception with the Court of Criminal Appeals. You're at the trial court. You're at a district court. You're accused of a felony. You're accused of capital murder. You are found guilty. With a capital murder, there's only two possible sentences. Death or life without parole. If you are given the death penalty, you get an automatic appeal to the Court of Criminal Appeals. You bypass that, that appeals court. It goes straight to the Court of Criminal Appeals. They have to accept your appeal. Now, if you lose your appeal, 
you can, you can appeal a second time on other grounds, but then it's going to go through the normal process. It's going to go to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals has to rule. Then if you lose there, if they choose to take it and you have it, you lose there, then once again, you can choose to appeal to the Court of Criminal Appeals, but then they get to choose. You get one free pass up there. You are guaranteed one appeal, but that's it. What do y'all know about the death penalty in Texas? That again. What do y'all know about the death penalty in Texas? That it's used more frequently than like most other states. Yeah, we use the death penalty a lot. But for four years, the United States actually, there's the Supreme Court put a moratorium on the death penalty. There was a question on the death penalty. Is it a violation of the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment? In 1972, it was decided that no, it's not a violation of cruel and unusual punishment, but the way states were applying the death penalty was unequal. We would see minorities receive the death penalty more often for less severe cases than for Anglos. So the Supreme Court says that no, the death penalty in itself is not unconstitutional. It's not cruel and unusual punishment. The way it's being applied is. So we see this four-year moratorium, this four-year halt. Supreme Court says, if you want to use the death penalty, you need to rewrite your laws to make sure it is applied evenly. 1976, the Supreme Court says, okay, enough states have rewritten it. Y'all are now good to go. We can start using the death penalty again. Texas, we do. Texas, we are number one. The last number I saw, I want to say through the end of last year, we were like 507 people we had put to death with the death penalty. Louisiana and somebody else were tied for second with like 108. We do use the death penalty in Texas. So... We have executed far more individuals than any other states. Texas Supreme Court. Once again, like the Texas Court of Appeals, nine judges. The case is heard in front of every judge all at once. So write down nine for each, nine for each court. They, have the, they are the final court of appeals in civil and juvenile cases. Juan, back to your question. Bifurcated, what does that mean? What, what do the, what's the difference between these two courts, the Texas Supreme Court and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals? So the Texas Supreme Court, it pretty much uh, includes original jurisdiction over like that, but it also like, shows that it retires judges and picks out new ones. No, 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 don't even look. Don't even go further down. Just that, that point, looking at that first point. What's the difference between the oh, two? So aside from the other ones, this one bases off of civil and juvenile cases, while the other one just deals with criminal cases. That's it exactly. Remember, that, that's an important point. Remember, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals all has authority. They are the final authority. They only hear criminal cases. The Texas Supreme Court, they only hear civil cases because remember these juvenile cases they're going to be most of them are going to be civil so the the texas supreme court is only civil texas criminal court of appeal is only criminal how should you be able to remember that latoya this is not a trick question how should you be able to remember which court has jurisdiction over which type of law I was right, and I don't even know how to answer that. I'm just going to be honest. How can you remember? Yeah, Brittany says by the name. 
Court of Criminal Appeals. This should tell you that they only have jurisdiction over criminal law. Thanks, Brittany. Wait, so do both the Court of Criminal Appeals together and the Second Supreme Court have nine judges each? Yes, they each have nine judges. There's nine judges on the Texas Supreme Court. There's nine judges on the Court of Criminal Appeals. These are two different courts. So nine judges each. Remember I said that most of Texas Supreme Court, most of their job was appellate jurisdiction. They're reviewing cases from, from lower, lower courts. And I said they had about yay much original jurisdiction. It exists. They don't use it much, though, so I don't spend much time on it. They have original jurisdiction over issuance of writs. They're going to, you know, write issue writs to the lower court, say, okay, produce this person so that they can come testify in front of us so we can hear their case, or else produce these records. Conducting a proceedings for involuntary retirement of judges, removal of judges. Does Texas have a cutoff for our elected officials or for our elected offices? Do we have an age cutoff? We well, you know you can be as old as you want. But what happens when you get older? What happens to your mental? About judges. What happens to your mental ability as you get older? It starts to go down bit by bit. It starts to diminish. So sometimes what we see is these judges, for for whatever reason, they lose their ability to to function the way they should but they don't realize it. So sometimes we have to have this forced removal. Years and years ago, I mean, back in the 80s, we had a judge in misdemeanor court here in Harris County, and I don't remember their name, but I know this happened, that one day out of the blue, they are presiding over a criminal trial. And remember, you're innocent until proven guilty. We had this discussion earlier. They're presiding over a criminal trial and they decide that this is the perfect time to whip out their pistols and start cleaning them on the bench. Now, guys, have you heard the saying, there's a time and a place for everything? Was that the time and place for that? Nope. No. For some reason, they thought it was fine. You'd start to wonder here about their, their mental ability. In other cases, while I was there, we had two of them. Well, once again, both in misdemeanor court, we had one judge who picked up a driving while intoxicated charge. And we had another one who was accused of sexual harassment. Should these people be judges? Well, they thought they should be oh. judges. They thought they should continue. Danielle, I agree with you. No, even if even if you're just charged, you resign, you can run again if you're exonerated. But no, so sometimes these judges need to be removed for whatever reason. And the Texas Supreme Court has to be the one to do that. Those are our, our courts and our criminal system. I want to go over a few other things. I don't care about that. You can read that. 35 years old, citizen of the U.S., resident of Texas, have at least 10 years experience. I want to talk about grand juries, petite juries. I still want to go over some other things that's going to help set up. These next couple of slides are going to help set up the, this next lecture. A grand jury has 12 people. The grand jury determines if there is sufficient evidence to try an individual. Grand juries are only going to apply to district courts. They're only going to apply to felony courts. What happens? The district attorney will come in. They will present their proof. This, this is why we believe Joe Blow committed a crime. The, these, this is what happened. This is how the elements were met. 
The defendant's not there. Their attorney's not there. Just the grand jury and these are this these 12 members on the district attorney. Once they present a case, once they present their evidence, the grand jury will vote. Yes, there's enough evidence here to believe a crime was committed. We need further investigation. We need to hold a trial. If nine of the 12 members of the grand jury say, yes, we need further investigation, there is legitimate reason to believe a crime was committed, they will issue an indictment. The indictment is just a formal accusation. Hmm? How many people do we need to say yes again? Nine. Seventy-five percent. Nine of the twelve. Now, a true bill, this is an indictment already approved by a grand jury. When a crime is committed, or you believe a crime is committed, are people always arrested at that point in time? No. No, they're not. You need time to gather evidence, talk to witnesses, all this stuff. So what might happen, or you might be waiting for some sort of scientific test, DNA, blood, whatever. So you're while you're waiting, you can't arrest this person because you're not sure it's the right person. So you get your... You get your results, they come back positive. The DA will then go to the grand jury and say, okay, here's my proof. This, this is my story. This is why I believe they, they committed a crime. Once again, nine of the 12 say, yes, a crime was committed. Here's a true bill. Now we're going to go arrest you because it, it took time. But just know about the indictment. That's the big thing. How do you serve on a grand jury? Don't worry about that. Grand jury happens before the trial. The grand jury is before the trial. Our petite jury. This is our trial jury. It's a jury in a civil or criminal trial. County courts, these misdemeanor, the county courts at law, these, these misdemeanor, Courts, class A and class B, they have six-person juries. District courts have 12-person juries. Now, remember, and Juan asked a good question. He asked me for clarification. At the grand jury, nine of the 12 have to say, yes, we need a trial. This petite jury, this trial jury, we are determining guilt or innocence. For a guilty verdict, it must be unanimous. All six in the, in the misdemeanor, all 12 in the felony have to agree, yes, the individual charged is guilty. You need all of the votes you can. Yes. Unanimous decision. All six, if it's a misdemeanor, all 12 have to say guilty. Now, if it's not unanimous, district court felonies like 8-4, that's called a hung jury. I talk about that in the next section. But to be found guilty, it must be a unanimous decision. Jury panels are selected from driver's license list. How many of you have ever got a summons to go serve on a jury? Better yet, how many of y'all have gotten this summons and ignored it? It used to be, we, we cannot get people to show up for jury duty. I don't think they want to see your tail. It's not a, it's not a periscope. People don't show up for jury duty. Even though they can be held in, in contempt for missing, they, they don't still don't go. Well, what happened is that our jury panels used to be selected from our registered voter list. 
Well, we discovered, the county, the state discovered, well, if I don't register to vote, what does that mean? If these jury, yeah, if these jury summons are, are based on the, who's registered to vote, if you're registered to vote, are you going to get called for jury duty? No. Yes, you are. Oh, wait, no. Not if you, if they're taking it from the people who from the list of people who are registered to vote. And if you're not registered to vote, you're not on that list. So are you going to be called for jury duty? No. No, you're not. So to increase the number of people that we could call for jury duty, we switched the list from the jury, uh, the registered voters, to the driver's license. Because you may not be registered to vote, but how many people have a driver's license? More or less? More, a lot more. A lot more, exactly. How many people are not voting nowadays? Like 20% Americans? Professor? Wait till the end of the semester. It, it, that That's an iffy question. It's going to depend Americans, Texans, and it's going to depend on what type of election. <laughs> that, that sounds like a horrible, a horrible question, but it varies. So I, I don't want to answer it till the last day or two I talk about voting and election. So if you can just sit on that question for another week or so, Bruce, actually, I guess two weeks, I'll, I promise you I will answer it then. And I promise you, you will be highly disappointed. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Remember how we're, we're now going to go into some different courts. I said those courts, the municipal court, the JP court, the county court at law, the district court, these all hear, hear cases. Civil law, criminal law. And I wanted you all to know the difference between county courts at law and county courts because there is a difference. County courts created by the Texas Constitution. Each county has a county court. So we have 254 county courts. Looking at this, who's the first one that can tell me how many counties does Texas have? Two hundred fifty-four. Two hundred and fifty-four. Remember the other day I said y'all needed to be able to infer stuff. You know, you, you can get information that your instructor may not go over. Said each county has a county court. There's two hundred and fifty-four county courts. This means there's two hundred and fifty-four counties. Exactly. These courts have limited jurisdiction. Most, almost all of them do not perform any criminal or civil court activities. They are only administrative courts. They serve as the head. Excuse me, Potato, I need to see my notes real quick. They serve only as the head of county government. Okay. What I mean by this, Harris County, we have a county court. County court consists of a county judge and four Harris County commissioners. Each commissioner is in charge of a precinct, much like the JP. They have their own precinct. Each commissioner is in charge of a precinct. They are responsible for their precinct. So what the county court does County, led by the county judge. Anybody know who our county judge is? Nope. A young Hispanic woman. Does that help? Latoya, you're close. It's not Linda, it's Lena. Lena Hidalgo. I knew something like that. I wasn't going to try to spell that last name for you. I was like, uh-uh. <laughs> but you were close. So, no, that's good. Lena Hidalgo is our county judge. We have our four county commissioners. Uh, 
they set policy for the county. Uh, any any budgets, they oversee county agencies. They set county tax rates. So they oversee the sheriff's department. That's the county department. How much money is allotted to them? The, the county jail. How much money is allotted to county agencies? What our tax rate, our property rates, tax rates going to be? Most of them, for this course, all of them are administrative courts. This is what they do. And then the county commissioners, they take care of things in their county. You know, county roads, county parks, whatever. So understand, county courts are different than county courts at law. County courts at law, criminal courts, A and B, class A, class B, misdemeanors, county courts, administrative. Statutory probate courts, I really don't care. They exist. That's it. Selection of judges. Last thing I'm going to say. In Texas, we elect our judges in partisan election. That means they run with party affiliation. In November, when we elect them, we know, are they Republican? Are they Democrat? Are they Libertarian? Are they Green? Whatever. They are, there's a party ID, party, party identification. Many judges are appointed to fill vacated offices. Remember, who can the governor appoint people to? What can the governor appoint people to? Judicial areas. Empty judicial benches. What's the other two? Uh, Police is in the house and they call special uh, elections for that, but we haven't covered that yet. Boards, commissions, empty judicial benches. Guys, what did I tell you the other day after I said I've said it six times? Why did I tell you I'd said it six times? I forgot I was taking notes during that time. It's important. So I just said it a seventh time. Why do you think I said it a seventh time? Because uh, most of these, like, it's are, like Republican it's, base. it's important. Yeah, just go with it's important. Appointments are made by the governor, once again, with the advice and consent of the Senate. Now, some states use what's called the merit plan. We elect most of our judges. If one dies, resigns, they're impeached then the governor has the ability, they have the authority to appoint somebody to that bench to fill that term. The states that use the merit plan, they are, this is they're appointed by the governor and they are retained by election. So to first get on the bench, you have to be appointed by the governor. You serve your term and then you're up for re-election, but you're not running against another individual you're asking the voters, did I do a good job? Will you send me back? And it's yes or no. If the voters say yes, you're reelected, you continue as a judge. If the voters say no, your bench is now empty, which means the governor gets to appoint somebody else to fill your bench. That's the merit plan. Are there any questions over what about what we went over today? I have one. Uh, give me a second. I'm sorting down something. Okay. If there's no questions, that ends this portion. Now, some of y'all came in late, so I'm going to go over what I said then. I have discovered, i would forgotten until today, Monday, Sunday is Juneteenth, Monday is a holiday. 
HCC observes Juneteenth. Juneteenth. Today we're supposed to. It's already. You mean the one I just finished or the new one, Tomoa? This one. This one. This one right here. This one. I'll I'll upload this one tonight. Monday is a holiday, so we are not having class on Monday. I was supposed to start the due process, the, the crime and corrections policy today, finish that Monday. We are not meeting Monday. So, why am I back to this? I have uploaded the lecture the crime and corrections policy. Due process. Okay, there we go. I want to make sure it's up so that y'all can see it. It's right here. Our due process video lecture. Please watch this before the exam. No class Monday, but please watch this before the exam on Wednesday. For those of you who weren't here, I actually requested y'all watch it by class Tuesday. So if y'all have any questions, y'all can ask me. Any questions about what we did today? Uh, yes, for for the teach trial jury, you said that you needed all votes to be jury. stated. So for that, you stated that you needed all votes to be stated guilty. But like, what happens again if like you don't get all the votes? In? It's called a hung jury. And I cover that. I cover the. I talk about the hung jury in the due process video. All right. Thank you. Just need to get that in there. Okay. Yeah. No. That. And that's why I'm asking y'all to watch this before Tuesday. If y'all have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So our exam will consist of the executive branch. The state judiciary and the due process. Is there anything else after that? Then I'm I'm gonna do bureaucracy Tuesday. All right. And so those four are gonna be good to be in the exam. And those four will be on the exam. Yeah. All right. Looking at this, the executive branch, state judiciary, due process, criminal justice policy, bureaucracy. Those four are on the exam. Finish it Tuesday, exam is Wednesday. Guys, do y'all have any questions or do y'all want to start your weekend? Well, at least from school. No questions. Y'all have a good day. Enjoy your weekend, guys. Enjoy your long, long weekend from school. You too. Have a weekend, Professor. Thank you. You have a good day. Talk to you later on. Bruce, did you have a question? No, I'm fine. Okay. Brittany, I know you came in late. Are you okay? Okay. Martha, are you okay? I thought you came in late also. Are you, do you understand what's going on? Y'all have a good day. See you later, Samuel and Taylor.